Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing thrombosis and antithrombotic drugs. Okay, so we've seen that thrombosis is really the activation of uh, the hemostatic pathway inappropriately. It's the activation of the hemostatic pathway even though you've got no hole in the side of your blood vessel. And we've seen that often what will happen is you've got some sort of disease of the uh, endothelium, such as an atherosclerotic plaque, which is an inflammatory response occurring just underneath the endothelium in the subendothelial space. Okay, and what it leads to is platelets firstly adhering to the surface of the blood vessel, then you get platelet activation, okay, which leads to the platelets releasing ADP and thromboxane A2. The ADP triggers a chain reaction which leads to just thromboxane A2 going up and up. The thromboxane A2 uh, causes vasoconstriction of the blood vessel locally. In addition, it leads to the platelets becoming sticky and they start sticking on top of the ones which originally adhered to the surface of the blood vessel. Okay, this forms uh, a platelet aggregate. In addition, you're going to get the activation of the coagulation cascades um, inappropriately. So you'll get fibrinogen being converted into fibrin and then into fibrin strands. These fibrin strands will be deposited amongst the platelets and will create a very rigid structure known as a thrombus. Now, the oft obvious problem with having a thrombus and also having vasoconstriction is that um, you're going to occlude the blood vessel and stop blood from being able to flow along this blood vessel. So the area of the body which was supplied by this blood vessel is going to become ischemic. Okay, So ischemia means that you've got no blood flowing to you or at least too little blood flowing to you. Ischemia. It's a fancy word for uh, lack of blood supply. Okay, now if you get ischemia in two very po important portions of the body, then it can lead to serious repercussions. I mean, no portion of the body is going to like ischemia, but there are two places where it's really uh, life-threatening to get ischemia to, which are the heart and the brain, so the two most important organs of the body, okay? So if you have ischemia of a portion of the myocardium or a portion of the heart, then that leads to what's known as a heart attack or the uh, proper name for a heart attack is a myocardial infarction, okay? So myocardial means pertaining to the myocardium, which is just a fancy word for the muscle of the heart. And then infarction means dying due to lack of blood supply, okay? So what happens in a heart attack is that when you have no uh, blood coming to a certain portion of the heart, then that portion of the heart dies if it remains um, ischemic for long enough. Okay, now that often can be fatal then and there. Uh, it can stop the heart beating, and when the heart stops beating, you're, you're gone. Okay, however, if you do survive a heart attack, then it will kill you in the long run. And let me explain how. So, it, ge generally, people who survive heart attacks go on to get heart failure. Okay, so let me show you a picture of the heart and try and explain what's going to happen. And don't worry, I won't go into too much detail about what happens in heart failure, but I think it is, it's an interesting topic, and I think it's relevant to put it in here when we're talking about thrombosis, or at least a little discussion of it here. I won't go into the full pathology. Okay, so here's our picture of the heart. So we've got the right atrium here, the right ventricle here, the left ventricle here, and the left atrium here. Okay, so if we imagine having a huge great lump of the wall of the left ventricle having died, okay? So this portion that I've circled in green has all been affected by the heart attack. So this portion of muscle is no longer existent. So it's all died. Now, the heart and the brain are so badly affected by ischemia. The reason being that they have incredibly low ability to regenerate themselves. And I always find this quite interesting, that the two most important organs of the body have virtually non-existent capacity for regeneration. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, basically, um, there is little to no division of cells within the heart and the brain after birth. So let me make this plainly clear. 
the cells that you have in your brain and your heart are the same cells that you have had since birth. You have, are not having cells within the heart dividing, you do not have cells in the brain dividing. So the cells that you have got in your heart and brain are the same age as you. Okay, there is little bends to that rule. There is some division in the brain and there is some division in the heart, but there's so little that it's trivial and effectively you can consider it a hard rule that there is no division within the heart and the brain. Now, this is a problem because if a huge great chunk of the heart dies, then those cells can't be replaced, basically. You cannot just make the other cells divide and replace, and, you know, make new cells which can replace those, okay? So instead what happens is the body brings in the fibroblasts, and the fibroblasts say, we will sort this all out, we'll replace all of these dead cells with collagen, brilliant. They replace it all with a beautiful scar, okay? Uh, which, you know, does the job, it fills the gap, um, but it's not contractile, it's not capable of contracting. Okay, so you've lost a huge portion of the wall of the left ventricle, and what this is going to do is it's going to make the left ventricle weak. Okay, so the left ventricle is going to struggle to pump blood from the left ventricle chamber into the aorta. And when the left ventricle fails, or in fact any chamber fails, what starts to happen is you get pathological hypertrophy. Okay, so what happens is this weakness of the heart will lead to what's known as pathological hypertrophy. So if you think about it, what's, what's the solution to the heart being weak? Well, we can't produce more heart cells. We can't um, divide. The cells of the heart can't divide. So we can't use that as a solution. We can't just make more heart cells. Okay, so what else could we do? Well, we could make the cells that we already have stronger. So there are two forms of growth in the human body. If you want to grow an organ, so let's say we've got an organ here consisting of four cells, or if you just want to grow a piece of tissue, let's say, this is our piece of tissue consisting of four cells, then either what you can do is produce more cells, okay, so cell division is one way to grow a piece of tissue, so we've gone from four cells to nine cells. That mechanism of growth is what's known as hyperplasia, okay, so that means cell division, okay. The alternative is that you can actually make each cell grow, okay, so you can make all of the cells bigger. This is what's known as hypertrophy. Now, the heart cannot use hyperplasia, okay, so the only option it has available to it is hypertrophy. So what happens is all of the cardiomyocytes, well, not all of them initially, but some of the cardiomyocytes of the left ventricle will now be induced to undergo hypertrophy. However, this is what's known as pathological hypertrophy, which is also known as maladaptive hypertrophy. And let me explain why it's considered maladaptive. Because what happens is these cardiomyocytes become bigger. So let's say we've got a cardiomyocyte here. What's going to happen is it's going to undergo this hypertrophy, and it might become a giant great big cell like this. And you'll notice that its width has increased much more than its length, and this is a feature of pathological cardiac hypertrophy, that the width of the cardiomyocytes increases far more than the length. Okay, so some of the cardiomyocytes in the left ventricular wall will undergo this hypertrophy, okay, and it's also known as concentric hypertrophy because you're thickening the width more than you are the length, okay. So concentric, and can I fit hypertrophy in there? Hypertrophy. Okay, so some of the cardiomyocytes of the left ventricular wall undergo concentric hypertrophy, and this is a temporary solution, basically. Temporarily, these hypertrophied cardiomyocytes are stronger. They are capable of producing more force when they contract. So a few of the cardiomyocytes in the left ventricular ventricular wall uh, will undergo this hypertrophy, and that will overall lead to those cells being able to contract with a greater force, so that their ventricle wall will become stronger again. Brilliant. We're done. Uh, the problem is that these 
hypertrophied cells gradually lose the will to live. It works for a while, basically, and this is why it's called maladaptive hypertrophy. It works for a while, but then these cells just decline and decline and decline, okay? And I don't mean they get, uh, they get smaller, they stay the same size, but their ability to, to produce force just goes down and down and down until it's actually much, much lower than the ability of the pre-hypertrophy cardiomyocyte to generate force. So these cells just become weaker and weaker and weaker. They become useless, essentially. So, what has happened then? We uh, started off with a left ventricle that was too weak, okay? And it was struggling to pump the blood from the left ventricle into the aorta. So some of the cardiomyocytes in the wall went, underwent hypertrophy. It brought us a temporary solution the problem is that these cells will gradually lose the ability to contract really at all, and they'll just become ridiculously weak. So overall, we are now in a worse position than we started off with, because we've now got a bunch of cells that are even weaker than they were when we started, so the whole left ventricle as a whole is now weaker, okay? So what do we do? Well, we induce more of the cardiomyocytes to undergo hypertrophy, so more undergo hypertrophy. Again, it will buy you a temporary solution, but then they will decline into uselessness as well, and gradually the whole of the left ventricle wall will just gradually undergo this hypertrophy until the point that the left ventricle is now so weak that it can't pump enough blood around the body in a minute, i.e. the cardiac output, which is just the volume of blood that you pump around the body in a minute, is so low from the heart that it isn't enough, it isn't delivering enough oxygen to the peripheral tissues to meet the needs of the peripheral tissues, and then what you have said to gone into, you're said to have gone into heart failure then. Okay, so when the heart is failing to meet the needs of the body, that's then said to be heart failure. Okay, and you can see how it's a horrible, vicious cycle. Um, so, basically, myocardial infarction generally then leads to heart failure for the reason that I've described, that it produces this initial weakness, which then sets off this vicious cycle of cardiac hypertrophy, which then declines into heart failure. Okay, and heart failure, there's no cure for it, in, other than a heart transplant, basically. Uh, so, myocardial infarctions are very, very bad. Okay, brain then. If the same thing happens in the brain, if you... Well, not the, not all of this. This doesn't happen in the brain. You don't get hypertrophy of neurons. No. Okay, but if, um, if you cut off blood supply to a certain region of the brain, those neurons will die if you leave the blood supply off for long enough. Okay? And when that happens, it's known as a cerebrovascular accident. So, let me put this up here. So, a cerebrovascular accident, or a CVA, and again, cerebrovascular accident, the more uh, common way, well, the more common name for a cerebrovascular accident is merely to call it a stroke, okay? Um, so, basically, a portion of the brain will die. And when a portion of the brain dies, you can imagine that this can have numerous effects. It will depend which portion of the brain dies. So if somewhere involved in the motor system dies, then you'll have motor deficits. If somewhere involved in the sensory portions of the brain dies, you'll have sensory deficits. Um, if somewhere maybe in the prefrontal cortex dies, then you'll have cognitive deficits, things like this. So there are a huge number of deficits that can occur due to stroke. So thrombosis is very, very dangerous, basically. Okay, in addition, you can also get, um, if I go back to the picture of the thrombus, you can also get portions of the thrombus breaking off and then going off into the blood, basically. So let me draw one of these. Here is a little portion of this thrombus which has broken off from the main thrombus and is now whizzing off around the blood. Now, this is what's known as a thromboembolus. So, where should I write that? I want to put it on this page, so I'll put it here. Thromboembolus. Okay, so an embolus is any particle, any large particle that is moving around in the blood system, okay, in the vascular system. Um, 
A thromboembolus is an embolus that is specifically made of a fragment of a thrombus, basically. Now, what this means is that you can have thrombuses forming uh, far away in, let's say, a massive great vein somewhere. And this thrombus can then break little fragments off. It can break off thromboemboli, and these can go whizzing off into the circulatory system, and they can end up far away from the original thrombus, and they'll continue going through the circulatory system until they get to a blood vessel that's too small for them to get through, and therefore they get stuck, and then they occlude blood flow through that blood vessel. So, thromboemboli are also extremely dangerous, so they can lead to um, stroke and myocardial infarction as well. And in that case, the thrombosis wasn't even occurring in the uh, affected blood vessel. It was occurring somewhere far away. It might have occurred in a massive great blood vessel that was far too thick to be um, blocked by a thrombus, um, but was throwing off thromboemboli, which are then blocking smaller blood vessels, and that can lead to an MI or a stroke. Okay, so these are very serious things then. Okay, so in the next video what we'll do is start looking at the antithrombotic drugs. How can we uh, prevent this happening in people who are at risk of this occurring?